Welcome to an edition of The Plain Guys. I'm Jeffrey Thomas, and I'm delighted to say joined by my co-host, Richard Godfrey in Germany. Good morning, Richard. And good afternoon, Jeffrey. Yeah, so today we're going to be looking at, uh, as we had suggested, uh, the crash of Transair Flight RDS 810 uh, out of Honolulu. Um, so, Richard, perhaps you can start off by giving us an overview of what happened to Transair Flight RDS 810. Sure. On the 2nd of July 2021, a Boeing 737-200 uh, ditched in the Pacific Ocean just 11 minutes after takeoff from Honolulu International Airport. The aircraft leveled off at 2,000 feet with engine damage to the right engine, and the flight crew uh, identified the malfunctioning engine. However, after leveling off at 2,000 feet, the first officer reduced thrust on both engines, and the captain, who was preoccupied with communications, failed to verify the engine status. Uh, subsequently, the crew mistakenly believed the left engine was the problem and continued to rely on the damaged right engine for thrust. Uh, fortunately, both crew of, of this cargo flight survived, and we're showing an animation of the crash. Mm. That's happened before, Richard, that uh, particular oversight. So describe the sequence of events that led up to the crash. Yes, at um, 01 01.4205 local time, the captain told air traffic controller, we've lost number one engine, we're coming straight to the airport, we're going to need the fire department, there's a chance we're going to lose the other engine too, it's running very hot. We're pretty low on speed. It doesn't look good out here. You might want to let the Coast Guard know as well. So they assessed the situation. At 0143, the air traffic controller said the plane should proceed directly to the airport on a heading of 060 and cleared the air airplane to land on any runway at the airport they chose. At uh, 24 seconds later, the captain told the controller, cannot man maintain altitude. And a few seconds later, the first officer said, pull back, we've got to climb, pull back. Uh, and then the stick shaker warned of a impending stall. And then the captain said, shoot, 300 feet and realized uh, it wasn't going to be long. And at 01.45.11, the captain announced twice, we're in the water, we're in the water. Now, the pilot survived. How did all that uh, happen? Yeah, the rescue uh, was pretty um, effective. There was a boat, a aircraft rescue and firefighting boat and a U.S. Coast Guard helicopter from Barbers Point Air Station. Uh, they were launched at uh, 0200 and 0218 respectively. Uh, the U.S. Coast Guard helicopter arrived on the scene at 0230, that's around 50 minutes after the crash. And the captain was hanging on to a floating tail section of the airplane. And the first officer was, uh, grab, had grabbed some floating debris and uh, was supporting himself on that. The captain was struggling to stay afloat after the tail began to sink. And he was hoisted from the water to the helicopter with the assistance of a rescue diver. Uh, the diver then re-entered the water and swam to the first officer and brought him to the rescue boat, which had also then arrived on the scene at uh, 0240. 
Uh, the first officer received medical care on the rescue boat and the captain was uh, taken with the helicopter direct to a, a local hospital um, and they both recovered from the, their injuries, uh, thankfully. Mm. So what is the ditching procedure for the 737-200, uh, Richard? Yeah, well, we're showing the descent profile uh, from the NTSB report. The recommended ditching uh, procedure for a Boeing 737-200 is uh, number one, an indicated airspeed of 130 knots, then a flap setting either at 15 degrees or 30 degrees, then you keep the gear retracted. You uh, choose a shallow descent rate around 200 to 300 feet per minute, a slightly nose up attitude, six to 10 degrees of pitch. And you touch down parallel to the swell or waves and not into them. Uh, if possible, you touch down into the wind, but that's not always possible because the wave direction and the swell direction is not always the same as the wind direction. We've included a link to the NTSB final report below for those who are interested. So what was the result of the initial investigation, uh, Richard? The wreckage was recovered uh, 3.2 kilometres off the coast in water ranging in depth from 107 metres to 137 metres. So it's very fortunate that the aircraft was close to the coast and that the water depth was not uh, horrendous, like four or 5,000 metres. Um, we're showing uh, also a screenshot of the seafloor view of the nose section of the aircraft. Um, so the aircraft was down to 157 knots at 1,000 feet. Uh, the aircraft was kept in a clean configuration. That means the flaps and the gear were retracted, and that's done to reduce uh, drag. And eventually they decided on five degree flaps uh, to help mitigate the stall warning on the stick shaker. Um, when you compare that, for example, with the Hudson River, uh, US Airways flight AWE 1549, an Airbus A320, but similar in size to a Boeing 737, uh, on the Hudson River, they used flaps two, which is uh, uh, 15 degrees uh, flaps and 22 degrees slats um, to maintain lift and airspeed without any engine power uh, at all. Uh, we're showing another screenshot of the uh, Transair 810 on the sea floor, this time the aft section. Uh, RDS 810 was estimated ditching at 159 knots and the final descent rate of 152 feet per minute uh, for the last 269 seconds. Uh, and they came down, as I said, from 2,000 feet. And the aircraft broke into two major sections. And when you compare that, for example, with Air France 447, the estimated ditching ground speed was only 107 knots, but the final descent rate was 10,912 feet per minute. And that came all the way down from 35,000 feet uh, from stall to impact. So what was the largest pieces of debris found from Air France 447? Yeah, there were two large pieces the vertical stabilizer was uh, found floating uh, and it measured 7.3 meters, that's 24 feet, by 3.8 meters, 12.5 uh, feet. We're showing a picture of the vertical stabilizer. 
And then another piece, which was the airframe at position 87, that's towards the rear of the aircraft and the rear pressure bulkhead. And that was found on the seafloor. Uh, it wasn't measured, but uh, you can see from the picture we're showing, this item is uh, several meters uh, long, uh, sitting in a hangar uh, following recovery. So this uh, air crash, how does this compare to MH370 and US Airways uh, Flight 1549 in the Hudson River? Well, MH370 was estimated from the whisper data ditching at 340 knots and a final descent rate of 1,700 feet per minute um, and cam came down from 40,000 feet and reaching speeds up to 15,000 feet per minute at uh, one point. Uh, the RDS-810, by comparison, ditching at just 159 knots with a final descent rate of 152 feet per minute, um, is a lot, lot less. But mm. nevertheless, it was enough um, to cause the RDS-810 uh, uh, to split into two pieces and... You've pointed out in previous episodes, Jeffrey, that if an aircraft's going to split up, it's going to be uh, the, the, around the strongest point, which is the wing box, um, and either forward of the, the wing or behind the wing. And this, uh, in this case, it was forward of the wing. Mm. And the Hudson River, the ditching... 125 knots and a final descent rate of 263 feet per minute is, uh, you know, hugely different to what we believe happened to MH370. And then you start looking at the Indian Ocean <laughs> and the wave height and uh, the weather uh, in the Indian Ocean at the Whisper crash site, so it'll be a little different uh, if your crash location is elsewhere, there was a 17.8 knot wind uh, and a swell from a different direction from the wind. The swell came from 225 degrees, the wind from 150 degrees, and the swell period was almost 13 seconds and the wave height was 2.59 meters. Now, in the Pacific Ocean, uh, from uh, the RDS-810, uh, the weather was also a high pressure, and the wind from 070 degrees at 14.6 knots, so it was a little less, and the swell from 85 degrees was similar to the wind direction, and the period of the swell was only six seconds, and the wave height was only 1.59 meters, so significantly uh, less than the MH370 uh, case. So mm -hmm. you can see even in 1.59 meter wave height, uh, you can break up into two major sections. So the inference would be MH370 broke up into at least two and probably three and maybe even more. Yeah. Quite a stark difference, really, Richard, isn't it, uh, comparing the two crashes? Yeah, and certainly no comparison to the Hudson River, which was an almost no. perfect uh, uh, ditching. So mm. it's interesting to compare the different uh, cases. And that's what a lot of people tend to do is they keep thinking about the Hudson uh, River uh, ditching and keep referencing it back to MH370 and it, it just it just couldn't be further apart. Yeah, and if you if you did want to do a controlled ditching on the Indian Ocean with a wave height of two point six meters or thereabouts. Um, it's completely different to the Hudson River, which, uh, you know, wasn't a milk pond, but 
by comparison, uh, didn't represent an issue. It's still on the Hudson River, tore one of the engines off uh, when mm. it ditched. Mm. Uh, that's sim simply that water is like hitting concrete. It mm. doesn't give. Um, and But then when you've got a wave height of 2.6 meters on top, uh, there's no way you're going to... Uh, come out of that uh, without uh, severe damage and as Blaine has shown time and again from the 46 pieces and counting uh, of uh, floating debris that uh, he and others have found it is quite clear that there was a huge damage to the aircraft and it's quite clear it broke up into several pieces and it is not sitting intact uh, on the ocean floor. Yeah, there's absolutely no chance of that whatsoever. None. So yeah, yeah. well that's uh, that's fascinating. And the the good the good part about this trans air crash is the two pilots got out alive. Yeah, and uh, thanks to the escape window in the cockpit, and thanks to a prompt. Uh, rescue uh, organization with the helicopter and the rescue boat so mm. uh, that mm. is uh, good news so richard uh, we're going to look tomorrow at questions from this podcast and also of course from the fbi and there's been a lot of questions about the fbi episode and that's probably enough to Fill two episodes, so <laughs> the next few days yeah. are kind of taken up. <laughs> last last time I looked, I think there was 140 questions on the yeah. FBI alone. So I've got to I've got to go through those tonight. So yes, <laughs> um, so so thank you very much indeed for this uh, Transair flight uh, review. It certainly um, brings into sharp contrast the different ditchings of that aircraft and the. Hudson River one and of course MH370 and uh, gives viewers an opportunity to look at the different dynamics uh, and the different numbers and the results that come from that. So thank you for that. Yeah. You're welcome. And I must also thank Blaine for his uh, podcasts with you. He uh, puts it across very well with the damage to individual items of debris. And when you match that with what the the sea state was in the Indian Ocean, um, and you get a, a picture of how an aircraft of that size ditches in the middle of the Pacific or the Indian Ocean, uh, you get a much better feel for what damage can happen to um, the debris and uh, give us a complete picture. So it'd be yeah. interesting to hear what Blaine thinks about uh, the various crashes and the comparison that we've done today. Mm, I'll, def de I'll definitely bring that up with him for sure. Um, so viewers, thank you for tuning in. Please subscribe to us, please like us, and please keep those questions coming. And of course, I thank you very much indeed for the wonderful messages of support. There's so many of them, um, and we do deeply appreciate them and uh, inspires us to uh, to do better work and to do it you know, a bit more professionally. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you, Richard. You're welcome. And viewers, please tune in tomorrow. And look forward to uh, look looking forward to your company. Thank you.